Um, so I'd just like to start by thanking you for coming out in such wonderful weather <laughs> again, uh, especially to learn about the prickly pear, which is probably one of our more underappreciated plants. And I want to start also by thanking the Linda Hall Library because uh, the library has a fantastic collection of 16th, 17th, and 18th century herbal texts, many of them quite rare. And hopefully a lot of the books that we're going to look at today we'll be able to see in the rare book room. So just thank you all. It's been so wonderful. The staff have been amazing, nothing but helpful. Um, it's been a really pleasant seven months. And I'm going to be sad to leave. But to start, when I tell people that I work on plants in the age of discovery, they're usually almost instantly interested, and why not? It's a really exciting period. The arrival of Europeans, Africans, and Asians in the Western Hemisphere in the years following 1492 precipitated one of the greatest, if not the greatest, biotic exchanges in human history, an exchange of flora, fauna, people, and microbes that is commonly known as the Columbian Exchange. And I put up an image here just looking at the plants, just the plants alone, and you can see that some of the world's most commonly eaten and or most nutritious plants are from the Western Hemisphere. Cassava, or also known as manioc, uh, many different kinds of beans, peanuts, potatoes, squash, sweet potatoes, and corn, just to name a few. The New World was also the source of some of the world's most common or important drugs, tobacco, quinine from the Peruvian cinchona, and the coca leaf from which we derive cocaine. Looking the other way, bringing old world crops and livestock to the Americas fundamentally changed American landscapes and in the case of sugar, helped to underwrite vast systems of brutal exploitation in the Atlantic slave trade. So if I were to break down how people approach the history of plants and the discovery of the new world, one way would be to focus on how plants change the material lives and environments of Europeans, Africans, Asians, and Amerindians. Another way of studying plants during the age of discovery focuses more on how encounters with and manipulations of new plants and environments constituted key moments in the development of science as we know it today. In this story, the, development, the discovery of the New World forced a critical reappraisal of the authority of the ancients as European naturalists discovered that many of the plants, animals, and cultures they discovered in the Western Hemisphere simply could not be found in the writings of the ancient Romans and Greeks like Theophrastus, Dioscorides, and Pliny. In this grand narrative, this erosion of faith in the absolute authority of the ancients and confrontations with new, never-before-seen peoples, plants, animals, and landscapes resulted in the elaboration of new methods of learning about and thinking about and understanding the world. In the case of plants, scholars have focused on how the study of plants emerged as a distinct field in the early modern era and how several key developments helped define bot botanical methods and to improve the quality of botanical information available to people. First, there was the proliferation of botanic gardens, which provided a sort of early empirical laboratory for naturalists to learn about and experiment with plants. And here we have a picture of one of the first botanical gardens, the garden at Padua. There have always been gardens, but ones that were explicitly devoted to learning about and experimenting with plants is a 16th century phenomenon. And this was established in 1545, I believe. Um, second, there was the development of the Hortus Siccus, which came to be called the herbarium, or the dried garden, which was originally a book in which plant specimens were pressed and dried. And this innovation contributes to the development of systems of classification and taxonomy in that you could collect your plants and you could preserve them and maintain them from observation and check them against one another. Um, and that helps you to identify whether you have a different species, when, which kind of species was invented. But it's about checking to see if what you have is similar to or different from something else that you have. Third, the proliferation of print culture and trans-imperial correspondence networks created and strengthened scientific communities and encouraged a culture of knowledge exchange on a scale that had hitherto been unknown. And here I just have a uh, Philosophical Transactions, which is a publication of the Royal Society, which was established at the end of the 17th century. Theoretically then, people were working out mechanisms for better identifying plants than they had ever had for testing their knowledge and for communicating their findings. In a related but perhaps somewhat darker tone, a third vein of scholarship has related this story of the emergence of modern science to the expansion of European empires and has emphasized the reciprocal and the mutually reinforcing relationship between science and empire. This scholarship acknowledges that advances in science were often a part of imperial efforts to manipulate the natural world and that 
These advances in turn helped empires to consolidate and demonstrate their control over subjugated peoples and environments. And here botanic gardens are understood to serve not only as a laboratory, but they're also a physical manifestation, sort of an advertisement of imperial power to alter landscapes. My larger dissertation engages with some of these stories, but from a slightly different angle, by talking about some of the difficulties and the ambiguous outcomes of what is frequently called colonial botany. In particular, I work on plants that did not lend themselves to early modern knowledge making techniques, and I compare failed imperial botanical initiatives to make successful uses of the plants with their uses on the ground, usually by subjugated populations. Today, though, I'm only going to talk about one plant, the prickly pear, and one aspect of my dissertation, the production of knowledge about plants in the early modern era, with the hopes of showing just how confused early modern knowledge production could be and often was. So in this way, my title is misleading. It's not really about learning about plants in the early modern world. Uh, the plant I want to talk about today, the prickly pear, challenges narratives that assume the superiority of enlightenment methods of knowledge production and also the assumed usefulness of that knowledge in promoting imperial agendas. I hope to suggest that by looking at failures of information, we see how limited early, mo early modern knowledge systems and practices could be. And so we might want to take a closer look at the successes of botanical innovation in the past, like the introduction of rice and indigo in South Carolina, just for a few examples, and perhaps question whether those successes really can or should be attributed to better systems of information. So just a little background. The Apuncha, which is the scientific name for the prickly pear, is a genus of cacti, all of which are native to the New World, that contains several hundred different species. When Europeans arrived, it grew all over the Caribbean and both North and South America, where many people cultivated them and grew them for their nutritional value. Uh, the leaves and the fruits are a good source of vitamin A, C, calcium, magnesium, and fiber and for their use in the production of a brilliant red dye called cochineal, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And just for a little bit of information here, I have put up a modern map of the prickly pear distribution just for North America. The map excludes uh, Mexico for some reason, but <laughs> from north of Mexico, North America, uh, the distribution of Apuncha. And just so you know, everything that's green on that map has native prickly pear plants. Everything that is light green is where there are a lot of native prickly pear plants. So although cactus plants today are enjoying somewhat of a resurgence of interest in native plant gardens, and the fruit is making more of an appearance in jams and as a flavoring in novelty cocktails, and the cactus pads known as nopales can be found in most grocery stores, we tend to be far from thinking of the prickly pear as an, a ubiquitous and potentially useful feature of our general environment. But if we might walk right by a prickly pear today without even noticing it, that was absolutely not the case in the early modern Atlantic world. It was among the first plants described by Europeans in detail, and certainly among the first that were brought back to Europe in the 16th century. And I'll talk a little bit more about the first impressions that people had of the plants a little bit later. But eventually, before it lapsed into a kind of obscurity and was even given the status of being an invasive weed at the end of the 19th century, it was considered an indication of the potential wealth of any given colony. So here I've got an early 17th century herbal text from the Linda Hall Library um, by Rimbert Dodens. And you can see that the, I've got, there's a, the prickly pear is right here at the entrance to the, the Garden of Paradise, recreated the terrestrial Garden of Paradise. Uh, and then there's another image from another text here at the Linda Hall Library by the apothecary to James I and the first royal botanist to Charles I, James Parkinson. And this text is absolutely fantastic because again, you see it's kind of hard to see here, but that's the prickly pear that you see here in the um, Why would these 17th century authors emphasize the prickly pear prominently in gardens of paradise? As I mentioned earlier, it was certainly a part of Amerindian diets when Europeans arrived, and it was a fundamental part of the terrace agriculture that was practiced by many different Amerindian societies in the Caribbean and Mesoamerica. But this was the real reason why Europeans were interested. Cochineal. And what you're looking at here are a genus of scale insects that exclusively live on several species of prickly pear or apuncha cacti. The female insects attach themselves to the cactus pads where they pretty much stay for the rest of their lives, exuding a type of waxy substance. So you see this little cottony looking waxy stuff that protects them from dehydration and filling up with carminic acid as a deterrent to predators. 
They're very picky little animals, um, but when the right species of scale is matched up with its preferred and exact species of Apuncia cactus, um, it thrives and fills up with even, gets larger, fills up with even more carminic acid. Unfortunately for the insects, this defense mechanism is precisely what made them attractive to humans, as carminic acid provides the base of a red dye that was far more vivid than the old world dyes of kermes and matter. It became an object of trade. So you see the British red coats, the officers' coats would have been dyed with cochineal that was traded in this transatlantic system. Uh, Europeans seem to have first become aware of cochineal when the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés arrived in the imperial city of Tenochtitlan in 1519. And after the fall of the city in what we today call the Aztec Empire, the Spanish rather promptly began exporting the dye back to Spain, where at, the height, at its height, the profits realized from this little insect amounted to approximately 20% of the Spanish imperial revenue. They left the production of the dye almost entirely in indigenous hands, and they were content to either accept it as tribute or to buy it back for re-export to Europe. But even if people outside of the Spanish colonies in New Spain had been becoming familiar with the prickly pear plant, and even if they knew there was a valuable red dye coming from the Americas, it doesn't seem as though people were exactly sure what the relationship between the prickly pear plant and the cochineal dye was exactly, and what role the plant played in the production of the dye. And this might be because the insects were tiny, and once they were dried and processed, you see here this is some dried collected bugs, it was pretty much impossible to tell, without the aid of a microscope, which hadn't been invented yet, whether they were vegetal or animal products. And it might also be because some varieties of the plant bore a red fruit that could stain your fingertips, and even if you ate enough of them, color your urine red. But I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. But even if people living outside of the cochineal regions of New Spain didn't know for sure what the source of cochineal actually was, they associated the prickly pear plant with the red, dry, red dye and saw its presence as a potential source of wealth. And I have a wonderful example of this from the English polymath Thomas Harriet, who was among the people who went to Roanoke in the end of the 16th century. Uh, Thomas Harriet wrote that he had seen a kind of pleasant fruit, almost of the shape and bigness of English pears, but they, that they are of a perfect red color, as well within as without, growing in North Carolina. This might be where the first incidence of the, the association between pear and the prickly pear comes from. I haven't actually been able to determine where that comes from. They grow in a plant whose leaves are very thick and full of pricks as sharp as needles. Some that have been in the Indies, he continued, where they have seen that kind of red dye of great price, which is called cochineal to grow, do describe this plant right like unto this. But whether it be the true cochineal or a bastard or wild kind, it cannot yet be certified, seeing that also, as I heard, cochineal is not the fruit, but found on the leaves of the plant, which leaves, for such matter, we have not yet so specially observed. Some people guessed that the source was an insect, but there was still enough doubt, perhaps, to make the idea of a serious venture into cochineal production seem rather dubious. The French apothecary, Pierre Pomé, quoted Harriet's comments about the prickly pear and cochineal in his widely popular General History of Drugs, published in Paris in 1694. Pomé included letters from French naturalists insisting that the source of cochineal was a small, louse-like animal that lived on Apuncha plants, but he also countered that he had received a letter from a French settler living in the colony of Saint-Domingue, who had insisted to him that the dye was, instead, derived from a plant growing there. Finally, he offered that the author William Piso, writing of Brazil earlier in the 16th century, had described a totally different plant from which cochineal was derived, the yamacaro, which looked nothing like the common prickly pear, and here he's reproduced the image from the, the Piso text, and made no mention of any louse-like animal. So Pemé concluded that those who posited that the dye was made from an insect had to be mistaken. Pomé's text was extremely popular, and it was quickly translated into English by an unnamed author and republished at the urging of one of the great naturalists in British history, Sir Hans Sloane, in 1715. Hans Sloane had, strangely enough, produced his own image of everything that went into cochineal production in his Voyage to the Islands, published between 1707 and 1715. Um, and I don't have the captions on this, but he claims that it's uh, in Oaxaca, in, in New Spain. And Sloan's image is a little bit interesting here because he unequivocally states that the source was insect in origin. 
He also says that they were grown on a cactus with no thorns, that they grew only on hillsides. And on fig I don't know where he's getting this information because he did not travel through New Spain. So clearly he's talking to somebody. Um, and he even says right here is an example that this is a descendant of Moctezuma. <laughs> like, but to return to the English translation of the Pome that Sloan had apparently encouraged, the complete history of drugs, uh, the editor at one point complaining about, quote, what a great many authors had said about various plants, much of it conflicting, subtracted Harriet's description, but then added to Pome's text that of other French naturalists, Louis Lemery and Joseph Piton de Turnfort further complicating the text without drawing any general conclusions about it. And he went ahead and added another image of the prickly pear, this one perhaps a little bit more familiar to what we think of as the prickly pear. Um, again, without any sort of description of whether it's more accurate than the other, the one preceding it. So it's just a cum an accumulation of information without a refining of it. So while lots of texts emphasize the presence of prickly pear in various colonial sites, and while botanical texts emphasize that the prickly pear had a place in man's recreation of paradise on earth, very little was done in terms of attempting to systematically cultivate and profit from the plants over the first couple of centuries of European presence in the New World, even as they continued to be grown for market and or cochineal production by Amerindians and enslaved people in the New World in the Spanish territories. This confusion about the exact nature of the cochineal, whether plant or animal, has been inter interpreted as the main stumbling block to the successful establishment of rival cochineal industries outside of the Spanish Empire, a stumbling block that was exasperated by Spain's policy of secrecy about its New World possessions and its refusal to allow foreigners free travel through its colonial possessions. So with the late 17th century invention of the microscope, it seemed as though the Spanish monopoly on the red dye stuff cochineal was finally destined to be broken. For the first time since the discovery of the New World, there was concrete evidence that the source of the brilliant dye was animal. And given how ubiquitous the prickly pear was throughout the New World and how recognizable it was, it seemed as though it were only a short matter of time before the French and the British managed to finally create their own cochineal industries to rival the Spanish. So did this happen? No but not from a lack of trying. Shortly after the invention of the microscope, and perhaps encouraged by the idea that the last obstacle had been removed, there were a flurry of 18th century real and proposed attempts to create competitive cochineal industries in areas controlled by the British and the French. And I'd like briefly to tell stories about two of these mid and late 18th century attempts, and to talk about the trends in misinformation and the disorders in imperial science that they reveal. And then I'm going to go back in time and talk a little bit about those tools that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk um, about how people learned about plants in the early modern era and to expose and explore, explore, expose is a tough word, some of the weaknesses that existed in those tools. The first story comes from South Carolina in 1746. Following the collapse of the rice market and on the heels of the Stono Rebellion in which a large group of enslaved people sought to flee south to Spanish Florida, the South Carolinian agent to the Board of Trade in England, James Crocat, published a pamphlet entitled Observations Concerning Indigo and Cochineal, dedicated to the planters of South Carolina and signed A Friend to Carolina. This is before there was an indigo industry in South Carolina. In this pamphlet, Crocat promoted indigo for 20 pages, but then he also wrote 50 rather confusing pages, encouraging South Carolinians to take advantage of the many prickly pears that grew in the region in order to produce cochineal. While indigo production required the elaboration of a series of vats and works for processing the indigo, cochineal, Crocat remarked, required nothing in the way of startup costs. The prickly pear already grew all over the Carolinas, and in many places, it seemed to have some sort of insect living on it that might be the cochineal insect. Even more, the cultivation was so easy, Croquet argued, that it wouldn't require much labor, perhaps hinting that the colony might want to rethink its reliance on such a large population of enslaved laborers. And there was plenty of information, he said, out there about cochineal and its host prickly pear plant. In fact, Croquet's text contained extracts drawn extensively from the English translation of the Pome, and at least 10 other sources ranging from articles published in the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, 
to French and uh, Spanish botanical texts, to personal letters he had received from anonymous sources. The end result was that Croquet's text contained too much information. While most, most of his sources agreed that the cochineal insect was made from, uh, sorry, that the cochineal dye was made from an insect, there were the usual questions about what kind of insect. One claimed that it was a ladybird, another a grub, another a fly. Some sources said that the cochineal insect self-generated from the cactus, while another that it hatched from eggs. Some thought that the insect fed from the blossom of the cactus, another from the leaf. Another insisted that it got its dyeing capabilities from the fruit of the prickly pear. And one source Croquette cited posited that it didn't even live on prickly pears at all, but rather grew on acacias. But this confusion is really nothing compared to the dizzying array of information that he gave about the prickly pear, the host of the cochineal insect. The sources disagreed on what it was called. It was thistles, prickly pears, Indian figs, tunas, tunals, opontium, raquettes, nopals, napal, palo de grana, shonostlis, just to name a few. One source claimed that it grew to be two or three feet high, another said eight or nine feet, and another said 20 feet. One source said that it grew only in temperate to cold ground. Another claimed that it only grew in hot climates. It bore fruit, or it didn't, or you should cut the fruit off. One source said that it had many thorns. Another said few. One source said that it was the wild version that had no thorns, or that it had really big thorns, or there was no wild version, or there was only a wild version. What a great many authors have said, indeed. It is no wonder that our friend Carolina wrote at the end of his text, quote, as there are so many and contradicting accounts about cochineal, I thought it the safest way to give the sentiments of different authors on that subject. But he did try to make some general conclusions. Having observed both wild and unproductive insects with their valuable carminic acid-filled friends, he wrote that they seemed to be of the same species. What made the difference, according to Croquette, was the host plant, was the prickly pear. Given the right feed, any cochineal insect could produce a valuable cochineal dye. But what was the right host plant? Was there a right host plant? One of his contributors wrote that all it took was the right cultivation to make the right prickly pear host plant. While the plants found wild, he wrote, quote, give but a small quantity of cochineal, yet when the same is transferred to a better mold, kept clean from weeds, at a distance from each other, and in soft ground, the differences became negligible. Talking about what a great many authors said about the prickly pear made it clear that there was in fact very little agreement about the plant's morphological characteristics and the effects that cultivation had on it. The issue was such a mess that in 1773, it appears tangentially in a publication by the English botanist and member of the Royal Society, John Ellis, who wrote about how naturalists and botanical entrepreneurs should transport live specimens of plants. Ellis, who had been in contact with several South Carolinians about cochineal, and he even, even submitted his own articles to philosophical transactions about cochineal, was writing excitedly in one of his pamphlets about the plants growing in the newly established botanic garden on the island of St. Vincent. But he stayed away from what the question of the plant identity for cochineal was altogether. And you see here, he just gives up. He says, it's that plant on which the cochineal insect is found. <laughs> kind of amazing. But for my second story, approximately 20 years after Croquette wrote to the South Carolinians, the Frenchman and aspiring botanist, Nicolas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, left the French colony of Saint-Domingue in February of 1766 for, the, for Veracruz, for the port of Veracruz in the colony of New Spain. Despite there being prickly pear cacti already growing in Saint-Domingue under the names of Opuncha and Raquette, Terry's goal was to infiltrate the Spanish colony of New Spain to smuggle back a breeding population of cochineal insects and their host prickly pear cacti, which he identified with the Nahuatl word nopal. His goal was to provide colonists in Saint-Domingue who lived in rugged terrain or on soils that had been impoverished by indigo sugar and coffee or who didn't have a large population of enslaved people to work their crops with a viable and valuable commodity crop. Perhaps given that Saint-Domingue had also just experienced a severe drought between 1775 and 1776, he also thought that finding a drought tolerant plant with low labor needs was important. So having read in many texts, perhaps also Hans Sloan's, that the finest grade of cochineal came from Oaxaca, Thierry resolved to travel overland all the way to Oaxaca from this purpose. And I put a little map up here. 
kind of hard to see, but he's essentially traveling from here. He goes to Havana and then into Veracruz. And then there are some areas of traditional cochineal production here, but he bypasses them to go down to where he'd read in a book the best stuff was to be found. So on arriving in Veracruz, Thierry, operating with a falsified passport, claimed to be a physician looking for remedies for gout and told the Spanish authorities he was going to a nearby spring to recuperate his health. Instead, he headed due south and west, and after several weeks of overland travel, reached the town of Oaxaca. Visiting a nopalry where he observed what he understood to be the correct insects growing on the correct cactus, he slyly purchased several nopal pads seeded with a valuable insect, telling the proprietor that he was a physician making a remedy for gout. Carefully wrapping them in paper and packing them in custom-made boxes, Terry turned to make his way back up to Veracruz. But along his way, he was surprised to see that his trail down to Oaxaca had been full of just the plants <laughs> that he had traveled so far to purchase. Uh, these were wild cochineal, he deduced, growing on wild cactus. But he went ahead, neither collected or bought several of these seeded pads along the way as well. So just put up a recap of some of this information. Outside of Veracruz, he was stopped by a Spanish official who asked Thierry where he had been and to open his boxes of precious cargo for inspection. Sure, just positively sure, that his seeded cactus pads were gonna be confiscated and that he himself was gonna be jailed or worse. Terry rather fearfully opened his boxes only to have the official ask him incredulously, why have you traveled so far for items that could have been procured so much closer to Veracruz? Having read many of the taxonomic treatises that were multiplying in the 18th century, like weeds, and in an astonishing case of a person privileging the text over the experience and expertise of a local informant, Terry told the official grandly what grew nearby wasn't the same species and that this was the only species that would do. The Spanish official swore that Terry was incorrect and when Terry once again insisted, the Spanish official remarked that this Frenchman didn't know New Spain as well enough in order to be able to contradict him. Terry again, armed with texts that had told him otherwise, was sorely tempted to correct the Spanish official about where one could find the true nopal and the true or fine cochineal, but he restrained himself for fear that the official would figure out that his goal was to break the Spanish monopoly on cochineal and wasn't medicinal at all. And so he finally, quote, left him the champion of the battlefield. Nonetheless, perhaps hedging his bets, in Veracruz, he did buy some of the wild cacti of Veracruz <laughs> called tunas before boarding a boat to return back home. But his struggles were far from over. The weather was bad, and the journey back to Saint-Domingue, which was not, if you remember from the map, that far, um, took almost four months in which the boat he was in was forced to make stops in the Yucatan and also on the northeastern coast of Florida. In both places, he just added to his store of prickly pear pads. But despite his best efforts to safeguard his cargo, including carefully pulling the pads out to air them out every night on the ship, Many of his cochineal insects died, and seeming all of his, seemingly all of his Oaxacan prickly pear had molded and rotted, and he ended up having to throw them into the ocean. When he finally arrived in Saint-Domingue, he was surprised to see that an insect that looked very much like his fine cochineal already thrived on many of the species of the island's cacti, and that many of these cacti didn't look so dramatically different from the prickly pear that he had seen and gone through such lengths to procure from New Spain. He promptly set up a garden with the cactus pads that had survived the journey from all of these different places and the various species of wild and fine cochineal that had survived. And he wrote an account of his adventures and what he had learned about cochineal. And that's what you see here is the title page. Um, while commending the great Swedish taxonomist Carl Linnaeus for having joined cacti together under one genus, Terry complained that there were just too many cacti and those that had been cataloged by Europeans were too poorly described and too poorly differentiated. For our purposes here, I'm going to put up some of those groupings. There were the Opuncha, which he said already grew in Saint-Domingue, the Nopals, and he distinguished here between wild, cultivated, and Castilian, positing that they're all different species. Um, then there were the Tunas, which he said were grown for fruit in New Spain. What made these things even more confusing was that all of these cacti appeared to resemble each other somewhat, making it difficult to clearly assign them their appropriate names. Even worse, the insects appeared to like different cacti consistently, but indiscriminately. So the tame insects he had gone to such lengths to acquire kept crossing over and liking wild versions of the cacti, 
and vice versa. Wild insects liked the varieties of true or tame nopal. His insects were clearly not respecting the distinctions between species that his botanical nomenclature was demanding. But before Thierry could puzzle all of this out, he caught fever and died. <laughs> and one of his successors, Joubert de la Motte, did manage to harvest a small amount of cochineal, but insisted that it didn't matter whether one used a wild or fine insect or a cactus native to Mexico or to the island. What was truly key to producing a good dye, he said, was to feed the cochineal insect good cactus. He's not too far off here. It's really about matching up the specific species of insect with a specific preferred host. Um, and he said the only difference between the cacti of New Spain and Saint-Domingue was that one had benefited from being cultivated and that you could make all of these changes happening simply by planting them in good soil and taking care of them. It's impossible to say whether Joubert was right and whether he had figured out the magical combination of the right cactus with the right insect with the right cultivation practices because he also died soon after. And then the colony and his garden were swallowed up in the Haitian Revolution. Obviously, while South Carolina did become known for indigo, it did not turn into a center of cochineal production. Most of us don't even remember that it was proposed at all. Nor did Saint-Domingue. But what I find particularly fascinating about both of these accounts is that they show such a dramatic confusion, not just about the insect that provides cochineal, but about the host plant itself. There are some serious, clear issues around nomenclature, the identification of species, and an uncertainty about the effects of environment, climate, or cultivation on the physical characteristics of the plant. And this is only really interesting when you realize that Europeans may not have had access to knowledge about the insect for very long, but they had had prickly pears for three centuries at this point, raising the question of what people knew about the plant and how the tools of botany that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the botanical garden, the herbarium, which is the collection of dried and pressed plants, um, and the proliferation of printed botanical text helped or did not help people to understand the plant. And for the rain remainder of my time, I'd like to just briefly go back in time and to use a sampling of a few texts to talk about how these three tools, uh, how they were used successfully or not to approach the prickly pear in the period of time leading up to these two 18th century schemes that I just discussed. Some of the first printed descriptions of the prickly pear come to us in the early 16th century through the writings of the Spanish chronicler Gonzalo Fernandez Oviedo y Valdez. After having spent time in Central America and on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, Oviedo published his General History of the Indies in 1535, in which he remarked that he had seen a very strange plant. And this is before he really had much experience of cochineal. This was, cochineal was discovered in 1519. Most of his experience was not in New Spain. So we have to think what he thinks of is strange about it. While you might think it was the spines that distressed Europeans, all cacti being New World plants and having no analogs in the, ol in the Old World, it wasn't. After all, thistles were a common plant in the Mediterranean and a general part of most Spanish and Italian diets. So not surprisingly, Oviedo called the prickly pear a type of thistle. But he also included its Caribbean Arawak Indian name, tuna. The strangeness of the tuna, Oviedo wrote, was located in the effects of its fruit and the pattern of its growth. I just want to take a second also to point out here that tuna is exactly, this is in Hispaniola, which is the island that eventually becomes divided and includes San Domingue, where Thierry left from. And he identifies tuna as being a Mexican plant when the name itself comes from the island which he left. Um, of the fruit, Oviedo wrote that he had first tried it when he arrived in Hispaniola in 1515. Traveling overland to the city of Domingo, Santo Domingo in the company of men who knew the land well, the group had stopped in a field and started eating the fruit with much relish because it was flavorful and the field was full of them. Before starting back on his journey again, the men went to the side of a river to empty their bladders and get ready to go. And Oviedo was shocked to see that his urine was the color of blood and that, in fact, he thought he was urinating blood, which was extremely terrifying to him. If you think about this time when, when uh, humoral theory held that blood was one of the key sources of life, that it, was, uh, it kept all of the humors in balance. So this was really, really frightening for him. Convinced he was bleeding out, he tried to stop himself first. And then he must have become really pale because one of his companions kind of slyly asked him if he felt all right and <laughs> said, told him that he appeared to have gone pale and that he must be very sick, frightening Oviedo even more 
until the guy started laughing and told him that there was nothing to be afraid of and that it was just the fruit who had, that had dyed his bodily fluids so. This story of Oviedo's has been repeated and reproduced ad nauseum. I found it in so many texts. Uh, and I just want to take a minute to posit that maybe the dying capacity of the fruit is often figures into questions about whether cochineal was made from the fruit or whether it was made from an insect living on it. And why so many authors thought, well, sure, if it is an insect, it needs to be an insect that's feeding on the fruit and not on the leaves of the cactus. Um, but if the fruit were somewhat funny to Oviedo, and he calls it a mischievous fruit, the growth of the prickly pear or tuna itself was downright disturbing. And Oviedo wrote that he just had to include images of the plant because nobody back in Europe would believe him if he didn't. And keep in mind that in the early 16th century, the authority of the ancient Greek and Roman thinkers was pretty much undoubted. The student of Aristotle, Theophrastus, from the 4th century BC, often characterized as the father of classical botany, had roughly classified plants in his inquiry into plants first and foremost by their size and then by their uses. So trees preceded shrubs, preceded vegetables and herbs, preceded plants used for grains and seeds, and the tree being the big principle description difference. Um, so why was the prickly pear so strange? Well, it grew, according to Oviedo, leaf upon leaf. And even worse, it was impossible to determine how it should be classed. And that's what you see here. He included images in two sections, one about fruit, and this is the one from the fruit section, and one about medicine. And here he says that this savage plant seemed to be, according to him, quote, a monster among trees. If it was even a tree at all, he couldn't tell because it never grew a trunk so much as the leaves that it grew upon somehow became sort of trunk-like. Even more confusing, he wasn't sure whether these were separate plants at all or if eventually all tunas grow into this much larger and stranger sort of tree-like, not really tree-like version. In other words, it was confounding even the earliest attempts to, to, to classify what kind of plant it was. Is it a shrub or is it a tree? One of the ways of dealing with this strange plant was to try to find a reference to it in the ancient sources. Humanist naturalists working on these ancient texts argued about whether the plant was the ficus indica, or Indian fig, mentioned by the ancient authors, which sprouted roots from its branches, or whether it was the opuntia, mentioned by Pliny, which sprouted roots from its leaves. Because I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the prickly pear, it's a very um, quick to reproduce plant. You can just take a pad, stick it in the ground, and it will start rooting and growing a whole new plant. So it's the, does it grow from branches? Does it grow from leaves? It depends on if you define the pad as a branch or a leaf. Um, and right here you see an image from Pietro Andrea Mattioli's 1565 Commentaries on Dioscorides, which is here also at the Linda Hall. Um, and he ultimately claims here that it has to be the mythical Opuncha, which sprouts roots from leaves rather than branches, coming down on the idea that this, the pads are leaves. Turns out the pads are not leaves, they're actually the, the thorns or the vestigial remains of leaves. This is the, the pad of a cactus is actually its stem. Um, so really, but what comes out of this is that you get more names attached to it, the ficus indica and the Opuncha. And today we have the modern named Opuncha ficus indica, which is just really strange. But the plant experienced a real boom in publicity after the arrival of Hernán Cortés in the imperial city of Tenochtitlan in 1519, when the Spanish discovered that the people we have come to know of as the Aztecs were using the plant widely as a food plant, but also in the production of the brilliant red dye cochineal. The inhabitants of Tenochtitlan, who spoke the language Nahuatl, called the plant something different. So, not tuna, not ficus indica, not a puncha. Referring to the leaves of the plant, they called nopal, and the fruit, they called nochtli. And the plant was so important, symbolically, to the imperial center that it even was a part of the glyph for the name Tenochtitlan. And you see here, this is from a codex produced in the early 16th century uh, at, at the behest of the first viceroy in New Spain asking about tribute that was paid to um, the city of Tenochtitlan. And right here is the glyph for Tenochtitlan, where it's Nochtli and Tetl, uh, which is the place where the prickly pear grows out of stone. This is a common symbol for, for stone. Um, within approximately 60 years, the, world, the word tuna had replaced the word Nochtli in, in the larger colony of New Spain, but only with reference to the fruit of the prickly pear. Nopal continued holding sway in discussing the leaves. Uh, and when it comes to discussing the whole plant in the late 16th century, I found sources that use either tunal or nopal. So you see again, new names added to the bunch. 
So going back to, yet to Thierry in the 18th century briefly, what he took to be different species, the Apuncha, the Tuna, and the Nopal, all were conceivably the same plants going by different names that emerged from this 16th century moment of linguistic confusion. And Thierry had perhaps been led astray by what a great many authors had said into thinking that a different name necessarily always meant a different plant. But to return to the 16th century, in an effort to acquire, to come to some sort of grip with all of the new plants and materia medica of his newly acquired colony of New Spain, the Spanish monarch Philip II sent his personal physician, Francisco Hernandez, to the New Spain from 1570 to 1577. And while there, Hernandez met with native leaders and doctors and hired native painters to draw illustrations of all of the plants that he found. When he returned to Spain in 1577, he had notes and illustrations of thousands of plants. But unfortunately, Hernandez died before he could write his own publishable volume. And even worse, all of these precious notes and illustrations, I mean, think about this 16th century native depictions and descriptions of their own plants. Um, all of these were lost in a fire in the Escorial at the end of the 17th century. But we know that his notes and illustrations had at least been consulted by many different natural historians uh, coming to Spain who incorporated them into their own works of natural history. And one of them that's also here at the Linda Hall Library contains one of my favorite images of the prickly pear that I've ever seen. And it's just fantastic. This is uh, from Juan Eusebio Nuremberg's Natural History, printed in 1635 in Antwerp. And looking at it, you might think, or you might notice that it looks remarkably like the glyph we saw on the Mendoza map. Here, there's like a sort of stylized version of the Aztec glyph for stone right there, which is kind of fantastic. Um, raising some questions as to whether the illustration Nuremberg and his engraver had consulted from this mass collection of notes uh, wasn't maybe a map or some other type of document that actually was trying to reference the city of Tenochtitlan on it. The caption on the illustration reads, <laughs> this great combination of names here, tuna or the nopal that grows out of rocks which is a lovely combination of native words in the Caribbean and the New Spain, which reveals kind of an ambiguous relationship of part to whole, is the text here implying that the tuna is just one kind of nopal? Is it saying that it's the kind that grows out of stones? Did the author realize that this image that he took to be a type of plant was perhaps also more likely a place name on one of the, the sources that he had consulted? As authors accumulated citations and text became more confused on whether each name represented a different plant, or what precisely the relationship between different names were, what was to be done with the accumulated information? Theoretically, the prolifer proliferation of botanical gardens and the development of herbaria helped to de develop and refine rough data about plants. Herbaria dating from the end of the 16th century to early 17th century were originally books in which natural historians layered and pressed their plant specimens. Eventually, in the 18th century, the book form proved to be too unwieldy, and people began keeping their pressed and dried specimens unbound so that they could be infinitely recombinable and added to. But as the 18th century naturalist Richard Bradley pointed out in his History of Succulent Plants, published between 1716 and 1727, it was almost impossible for botanists to press and dry plants like succulents because of their succulents. This isn't to say that people didn't try to dry them, but as Bradley was making clear, drawings were a better option. And in his ad for this text, the proposal for printing this work, which was published a few years before it was actually printed, he wrote that this book will only contain such plants as are not capable of being preserved by dry specimens. Uh, going back to Hans Sloan, who we already looked at um, in his History of Jamaica, he wrote that after I had gathered and described the plants, I dried as fair samples of them as I could to bring over with me. When I met with fruits that could not be dried or kept, I employed the Reverend Mr. Moore, one of the best designers I could meet with there, to take the figures of them. And you can see here an image from his herbarium that is now in the British Natural History Museum, in which the prickly pear fruit was drawn rather than dried and pressed. So what does not being able to uh, assuredly identify individual species do, to have samples that you take back and you check closely with other samples? And what did it do when it was compounded by having text that always included what a great many authors have said? 
Not being able to precisely identify species and having conflicting information about the appearance and growth cycles of the plants makes it almost impossible to learn accurate information about them in gardens. So in his 1640 text, the monstrously huge Theatrum Botanicum, which we have here and which I hope will be out in the rare book room, to look at Parkinson, the apothecary and botanist, remarks at length, and we'll just quote this, the, greatest, the greater Indian fig groweth in some part of the West Indies to have a body or trunk as big as one's arm or thigh, and from thence shooteth forth his leaves. But in other places it groweth from a leaf first set into the ground, and there shooting forth roots and others rising out of them, and so one out of the other, being formed into branches of such leaves like into branches of other trees. Each of these leaves are very large, and as thick as one's hand, and larger in many, beset with small, sharp, and somewhat long white prickles, or thorns. But in Europe, they are not so thick set. Now, what's, what's important here is that I just want to stress that whenever a variety of prickly pear that Parkinson had didn't grow the way he expected it to, given what he had read in his text, it was the climate that was responsible, rather than the possibility that he had a different variety, or that somehow its growth cycle had been misdescribed. In other words, the garden validated what he thought he already knew, as opposed to providing new usable information. This is really important. For a person to judge whether a plant has acclimatized in a botanical garden, they have to have first accurate information about the plant's complete growth cycle, and they have to be sure that they have the plant that was being described. And this seems fairly straightforward, possibly because we are so used to looking at the great success stories of botanical transplantation of the past. So for, to go back again to South Carolina and indigo, when Eliza Lucas Pinckney was experimenting with indigo in her garden in South Carolina, the same time that people were suggesting experimenting with cochineal, she had a garden to experiment in, a reliable set of identifiable plants, and reliable information. But perhaps even more important, she had the help of actual people who had experience growing and processing indigo elsewhere. So this is leading me into my conclusion. What are our takeaways? What do we make of this sampling of texts that we have seen today? For one thing, it's clear that by looking at European attempts to create cochineal industries and the knowledge of prickly pear plants in particular, we do not see botany as a handmaiden of empire in which information collected from the colonies was systematically tested, refined, condensed, and redeployed. Rather, we see a proliferation of names leading to a prol proliferation of taxonomic categories and the inability of botanic gardens and herbaria to provide usable information with which to test those taxonomies. And what does knowing this do for us? Well, for one thing, it helps us to understand in part how the classifications and identifications of Apuncha cacti are still so contested and messy today. They are still constantly being revised. There is even a, a proposal that there should be a genus Nopal separate from the genus Apuncha, but in some systems it's considered to be synonyms. Perhaps dating back, I mean, think back to, to Thierry saying that the Nopal was somehow distinct from the Apuncha. Um, oh, goodness, where did I just lose? So the proliferation of names and a lack of an ability to refine and test data systematically resulted in what we might call an over-described genus. So botanists must determine today whether the names of plants, many of which date from the 18th and early 19th centuries, describe separate species or whether they're synonyms for the one and the same plant. The absolute messiness of information accumulation about prickly pears destabilizes the notions of metropolitan science as a center of calculation in which data drawn from the peripheries is systematically tested, refined, and redeployed. And this, I think, is a kind of a salutary benefit of revealing that imperial expansion and botanical initiatives may have been much less calculatedly efficient than they have previously been characterized. Exposing the fallibility and weakness of the production of botanical knowledge also encourage us to look for more of a reason for when things go right. So going back to Eliza Lucas Pinckney, if book knowledge isn't necessarily sufficient to the successful commodification of a crop or to its introduction, then what is? And here we might need to look more at the sources of experiential information when it comes to crop growing in the early modern period. And this, in the early modern period, often means the people doing the work, the farmers, the laborers, the enslaved peoples, the indentured, the indigenous or not. Looking at the production of misinformation and at botanical initiatives gone wrong is also beneficial for opening up another set of questions. And what I did not go into today, but what my dissertation attempts to in part uncover, is how even though 18th century commodity schemes to create cochineal did not work out well, subject populations on the ground encountered and made use of the plants that imperial powers could not understand or control. Because people were using them on the ground. 
In the Caribbean and perhaps along the North American coast, enslaved people grew prickly pear and sold its fruit at markets. The plants made passages into maroon enclaves difficult, and it figured into the medicinal practices of people who did not regularly have recourse to licensed doctors. When the plants were taken around the world in the 18th century, because they were taken to South Africa, Madagascar, India, and Australia, they similarly appear to have escaped imperial control and to have quickly naturalized in these environments. And this raises all kinds of questions of how subject populations made use of the gaps in imperial knowledge. And given that the prickly pear was increasingly seen in the 19th century as an unruly, uncontrollable, and invasive weed plant, we might also need to ask a question about how imperial failure and how much knowledge failures might have affected later ideas about the plant, or how they might have obscured its potential uses in various regions about the world, around the world. In today's world of famines, droughts, and shrinking resource bases, we must ask about how a plant that people thought so much of at one point becomes a plant that people think so little of later on, and whether or not we can afford to collectively forget the value that once adhered in a plant that's so well suited to so many marginal landscapes around the world. And at the very least, I hope that the next time you pass prickly pear or enjoy my favorite, a prickly pear margarita, that you might take a moment to ponder the thorny issues that it posed to people in the early modern era. Thank you. Thank you, Jerusha. Uh, raise your hands if you have questions. I'll bring uh, the microphone by. Just remember to hold the microphone pretty close to your mouth. Did the Native Americans extract the dye? So did the Spanish learn from the Native Americans how to the process of extracting the dye? And this leads to my real question is, if they knew how to extract the dye, it was going to be far easier to send the dye across the ocean rather than try and send the plants over. Am I good? Or did I just mess it up? Um, that's a really, really excellent question. Yes, Native Americans were extracting the dye. Um, and, but whether or not that knowledge seems to have been transmitted from the farm to um, Spanish high science is really unclear. Because at the same time that Terry is making his travel through New Spain, stealing the secrets of Cochineal, there was a Spanish enlightened figure who was also writing his own history of Cochineal and uh, Nopales in Mexico City, trying to explain it to a Spanish audience. And eventually his takeaway is that you need to leave this in the hands of the Indians. So they were just transporting the dye. This is a time period when a lot of the French and British and Spanish relations were not so friendly. And so for the, the French and the British, their interest really is in establishing their own, their own dye industries, as opposed to buying it from, why, why give Spain the money, in other words? Uh, when was the term cacti or cactus first used? Hard to find the actual like first time, but one of the earliest references that I found just comes from uh, Linnaeus. So he talks about the cactus, right, as being. So that's, he's also a person who codifies the description of a puncha. So it had been floating around for a while, but he's like, this is what we're going to call it from here on out. You said that the botanical gardens started in about 1550. Were they a direct result of this inflow of plants from the New World, or was that just a fortuitous timing? It's a really great question, and if you're talking to a historian of science or a historian of uh, European intellectual history, they might say no, that it's not a direct result, but if you talk to a historian of the Atlantic world and the Americas, they would say absolutely this is. Um, it's really, it's, it's a tough question um, because it's hard to know. This, in this humanist push to really understand having re-gotten back the texts of the great authors and really wanting to get to like saying that we need to get the best possible translation. There's a big desire to find the exact plants they're talking about. Um, so the exact plants that come out of Theophrastus, out of Pliny, out of Dioscorides. This is something that there's, would that have happened even without the New World? Possibly. Um, I, mean, I, think, I think it's impossible to me, it doesn't seem plausible that you could have a discovery of such a great, enormous territory 
with its own highly developed sense of medicine and highly developed sense of botany and not have that affect the way people were thinking about plants and wanting to learn about plants. So I think absolutely to say that botanical gardens emerge out of this moment and emerge out of contact, I would say yes. Okay, I was gonna ask if there are any other questions. Here's one. Are there any other of the cactus that have the insect uh, operating on it in the same way as the prickly pear? Die? No, it's pretty much exclusive to the Apuncha genus or the Nopalea genus, if you believe that they're two separate genuses. Has there been a strong evolution with these insects over all these years? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of remarkable, you know, uh, evolutionary developments to have a, an, an insect that lives so exclusively on this particular type of plant. Um, I don't particularly, I've met with entomologists who have been talking to me about the actual evolutionary history of the scale insect because as far as scale insects go, they're incredibly particular. There are a lot of scales that can live off, you know, hundreds of thousands of different types of, of, of plants, but the cochineal, the dactylopius, can't. It's very circumscribed, or at least it won't thrive. I mean, it might, there might even be a couple of species of prickly pear that it will do really well on, and then some that it will do middling okay on. So it's really about getting that perfect match. The way the Europeans understood it was that they needed to get the domesticated version. <laughs> that's not the case. It's about finding, and the domesticated cultivated version of the, the plant, but that's not really it. It's about getting the right ma match between plant and insect. When you have uh, that close of a relationship between the cochineal and the opuncha, opuncha um, is the cochineal doing something for the opuncha that, that uh, the, obviously the opuncha is a host for the cochineal, but it seems like there should be some give and take. Like that should be that way, but one of my, <laughs> One of my favorite stories about this, and it's, it's a 20th century story, so that the French take the um, prickly pear to Madagascar, and there's great work being done on this by scholars Karen Middleton and Jeffrey Kaufman. And once they get it there, they mean to ring their fortresses because they're hostile natives that they want to keep out, and so they, they plant it in prickly pear. And then what happens is the Malagasy start creating this cattle industry using the prickly pear. Um, and they start ringing their, their villages in prickly pear hedges, which makes it really difficult for these colonial officials to go in and start you know, exerting their control. And they complain about it, and they complain about it, and they complain about it, and say, we need to get, and you know, they're like, this is a weed, it's no good. You know, think about how wonderful their cattle industry would be if we could get rid of this and plant more nutritious foods. Um, and so they import, and like in a, I think the story goes, in a matchbox, a cochineal insect that wipes out the island's cactus in like five years, almost entirely. Um, and it's a case of the, the, it was the food, that cactus was just too scrumptious to that insect, and there weren't a, any of the native uh, predators of the insect to keep the population under control. Um, and what they did not realize, actually, was that the boom in the Malagasy population and the boom in the pastoral industry was entirely dependent on the prickly pear. So when they got rid of it, it just kind of collapsed and there was this huge famine um, that was just comes from people in charge seeing this as a weed plant that has no beneficial uses um, and introducing this, this. But to get back to your original question, it's not a give and take. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it is doing much for the actual cactus. Would the uh, prickly pear be something that could uh, be cultivated uh, in a garden, home garden, kitchen garden in this uh, area? Yeah, I mean, they grow wild, and uh, we have some here, actually, but they're under snow, I think, <laughs> in the garden. I don't know if they will achieve the same kind. It depends on the variety that you're growing. I don't know if you'll get the same height of some of the plants that would be found further west or further south. But yeah, you can, I mean, they are native, if you remember that map, all the way up to Canada. 
there's a section, I spend most of my time in New York, I'm a student at NYU, there's a section in the Botanical Garden of Native Plants in uh, Brooklyn that's got the prickly pear growing. Um, there it grows sideways to maximize the sunlight, whereas in the particularly hot and sunny areas it grows vertically, which is kind of, yeah, you can absolutely grow it. You could even, I, was, I realized this the other day, I was talking to my mother and I was telling her that she should grow some, we should have some prickly pear fruits. So we went to a nursery and we were asking and they looked at us like we were crazy. My mother lives in New Mexico, which has lots of prickly pear. <laughs> and they looked at us like we were crazy, like why would you want this plant that everybody else is trying to keep at bay? And we couldn't find, we, they were offering us these really tiny, like low-lying humifusa ones. And then I realized that you can go to the grocery store and pick up a nopal pad and just plant it right in. There's no need to go to a special landscaping source for that. The uh, genus Opuncha also includes choya. Are they a substrate for this? Well, from what I understand, and this may have changed or it depends on which source you're looking at, the cylindropuncha would be what includes choya, um, but that's only a recent addition to what we define as a puncha plants. That's something that has only happened, I think, in the last 50 years that they've started classifying those plants together. Um, before that, they were under different categories. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but as far as I know, the cylindropunchas don't provide good hosts for the decalobius, as far as I know, or at least not for the one that produces the, the dye. Jerusha for the wonderful lecture.